I'm just going to keep that down. <clears throat> okay, let's give it a go. Right? So good morning. And I'm looking forward to bringing you this reading and this sermon today on Palm Sunday. So the readings from the Gospel of Mark, chapter 11, verses 1 to 11. And so hear the word of God. When they, the crowds, Jesus and the disciples, were approaching Jerusalem at Bethpage and Bethany, near the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two of his disciples and said to them, go into the village ahead of you, and immediately as you enter it, you'll find there a colt that has never been ridden. Untie it and bring it. If anyone says to you, why are you doing this? Just say this, the Lord needs it and will send it back here immediately. They went away and found a colt tied near a door outside in the street. And as they were untying it, some of the bystanders said to them, what are you doing untying the colt? They told them what Jesus had said and they allowed them to take it. Then they brought the colt to Jesus and threw their cloaks on it, and he sat on it. Many people spread their cloaks on the road, and others spread leafy branches that they had cut in the fields. Then those who went ahead and those who followed were shouting, Hosanna! Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the coming kingdom of our ancestor David. Hosanna in the highest heaven. Then Jesus entered Jerusalem and he went into the temple. And when he had looked around at everything, as it was already late, he went out to Bethany with the twelve. And so, Lord, through the power of your Holy Spirit, I ask today that you yourself would speak. You yourself would open our eyes, open our ears, and speak to us a word that we need today. We ask it in the name of Christ. Amen. So, this scripture caused me to think a lot about parades. And I kind of figured parades come in three flavors. You've got a parade of celebration, You've got more of the ceremonial parades. And then, of course, there's the protest parade. And so it made me think about Jesus' parade on Palm Sunday. What kind of parade was this? Well, at first blush, it looks like a parade of great celebration. In the biblical tradition of Miriam's parade, when she led the women uh, singing with their tambourines after the Red Sea had closed down on the Egyptian chariots and the army and wiped them all out, saving the people of Israel. The hosannas, the branches, the, the cries of joy leading Jesus, following Jesus, the crowds. There is such a spirit of celebration in this parade. And so that made me start thinking about my first parade experience. I was a little kid, and what I remember is holding my mom's hand in Mobile, Alabama, which is where the first Mardi Gras parades were started. Uh, New Orleans eclipsed the Mobile-style parade, but we were first. And there are giant floats all decorated with people in crazy costumes and masks. And there's music, marching bands, it was usually at night, so there's smoke. And people are hurling um, little trinkets and goodies and uh, like moon pies. And for a kid, this was something to, to never forget. So I, I kind of think of Jesus' parade as similar to that. Just, there's a spirit of celebration. Everybody's there for the same reason. But then I started thinking that Jesus' parade also was a type of ceremonial parade, at least in the people's eyes, this is the coming Messiah. 
This is the fulfillment of the prophecies in the book of Zechariah. And this is the moment where the, the saviors appeared and, and they're, they're going to be saved. Something's going to change. And even, even the palms are these symbols of peace. This is a peaceful uh, king that's come. And he's come on a donkey. So there's quite a ceremony going on. And there's also another parade going on at the same time. Because on the other side of Jerusalem, Pilate is entering with his, with his uh, ceremony of the representing the emperor, who was known as the son of God. Um, Pilate would come into Jerusalem on holiday feasts, particularly the Passover, and bring his, his military men to keep the peace because um, there were huge crowds and, um, you know, things might get out of hand. And so he comes in on a war horse with his, with his armed guards and uh, bringing in the, not only the message of Roman domination, but the message of the Roman gods because he's going to go straight to, the, to, to give a sacrifice to the Roman gods. So this is a huge ceremonial parade. I found the most fascinating book that talks about the last week of Jesus' life. It's by uh, two men, Borg and Crossan, and they dig in to the contrasts between these two parades. Part of the reason I think they wrote this book is they, they name, they want to they wanna give a little pushback to Mel Gibson's The Passion of the Christ, which many of us have seen, and which really emphasizes the last 12 hours of Jesus' life and emphasizes the brutality of what he suffered and the, uh, the torture and just the pain. And I, I think that Borg and Crossan want to push back on that not being the whole story, and also, they want to push back on what they sense in that movie is a, is a message of demonizing Jews. Um, because I think they're concerned that, that somehow our Christian tradition has in the past um, really laid the blame for Jesus' crucifixion on the Jews. And there's been, throughout history, terrible, terrible responses from the Christians in persecuting Jews. And so they're pushing back on um, that, that representation, and they're calling this moment when Jesus comes into Jerusalem on a donkey as political theater. They argue that Jesus is intentionally doing this. He's intentionally drafting in on the whole tradition, the prophetic tradition that's named in Zechariah, that the king, the coming Messiah, comes on a donkey as a peaceful king. He's coming to bring life and newness. And they, they call this moment, this parade that Jesus comes in on, a prearranged counter procession to Pilate's. And what's so odd, and should be a clue for us, is that after this fantastic parade, Jesus goes to the temple, looks around, and since it's getting dark, he goes right back where he came from, to Bethany. So there is a little bit of an oddness in this parade that these authors are picking up on. They also want to point out how quickly this adoring crowd, this crowd that has been, many of whom have been following Jesus from Galilee, they've seen Jesus heal. They've seen him raise Lazarus from the dead. And now they're coming to join into this grand finale these, many in these crowds, will go from yelling Hosanna to crucify him. They're going to go from adoring him to jeering him. And, and they're going to turn away from being the crowds that have kept Pilate and the religious leaders from, from arresting Jesus to the crowds who urge them to arrest Jesus. Because Borg and Crossan really named the fear that's involved when you really put the power of empire 
and domination next to the power of compassion and love. Reading through all of this caused me to go back and think about those Mardi Gras parades. And now that I'm older, I really do see more than just celebration in those parades. Now that I look back, I see how they were actual ceremonies of exclusion and racism. And, and um, gender exclusion, too, because, you know, you, um, the, 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 the white man parade always went first, was always the grandest. Then the women got a shot at it. And then many black people in the area began to host their own parades as kind of a counter protest against what was going on. And ultimately, I see this parade on Palm Sunday as Jesus' protest parade. He's protesting injustice and power and oppression in a very, very powerful way. And realizing this then caused me to remember the only other parade I've really ever joined, and that was January 16th, after the most powerful man in the world um, step, stepped into power, and um, there was a groundswell of fear among many women I knew that this powerful person also harbored very powerful misogynistic beliefs. And I, like many women, got together in New York City and elsewhere in the nation to basically protest this. And it was amazing. Even though it was mainly women, there were men there. And what was so interesting is to look around and it's like the whole world showed up. Every woman of every size, every color, every background, carrying these amazing signs, ranging from, um, you know, there were the, the political pro-choice and different causes that people were into, but signs like America will never be great again until we're all equal. Unite against fear. And the sign I chose to carry was pray for our nation. And I... I didn't realize at the time what a powerful protest this actually was. Ultimately, the whole idea of parades can be a powerful framework for us to think about the world and about being a Christian. Because if you look around with this framework, you can see a bunch of other parades going on. Obviously, we, we have just had the January 6th parade of mainly white men carrying signs with mainly one man's name. Jesus was thrown in there a little bit, but that was one parade. Um, we've just had our uh, book discussion on Isabel Wilkerson's cast. And in the book, she describes in great detail Hitler's parade into Paris in 1940, when he basically argued, when she argues that that um, when you look at this parade, women, children, and men with just ecstatic expressions on their face, Heil Hitlering, that Hitler couldn't have done what he did without the support of the crowds. And, and she, she argues that, you know, most of the people there felt very chosen and important. And she asked the profound question, what would we have done in their place? You know, would we have had the courage to stand up to the multitudes? And... Um, you know, she says she knows she would have never attended a lynching, but tens of thousands did in the South and in Germany and in India. You know, everybody loves a parade, but, but Jesus completes his Palm Sunday parade alone. He his parade ends in death and ultimately resurrection and ascension. And then Jesus' post-Easter parade begins. His parade continues, and the crowds continue to stream into that parade, and now billions have entered his parade, and there's more to come. This post-Easter parade is a parade of celebration, of new life, new creation, justice, liberation, it is a ceremonial parade of the promised Messiah, God's one and only Son. And it is a protest parade. It continues to be a protest parade against injustice and domination and evil and hate. 
And you know, we just confessed today that um, we need to be in a peaceful protest against an unjust empire. That's the call on, on all Christians. This parade is a parade for sinners. Jesus has died for every single person. And we need to live out this truth when we enter into a parade of homeless people, ex-cons, um, people of every um, tribe and nation and tongue, as it says in Revelation, that we need to um, be carrying messages of peace and compassion and brotherly love and justice. Because ultimately, this parade of Jesus is today, the one that he began after his ascension, is a prophetic parade. And it's prophesying that there's really only two parades going on in the world right now. They parallel Pilate's par parade on Palm Sunday and Jesus's. And the question is, we have to, as Christians, really discern which parade are we going to be in. And we need to really discern who's in each one of these parades and what are the messages that are being carried in these parades. You know, if, if you look around and you see only one color, one gender, everybody looks alike, you're probably in the wrong parade. And it's, this whole parade framework has given me um, a sense of even looking at some of the tragedies in the news today. I mean, we've had this mass murder, two, both by 21-year-old men, one in Georgia, uh, in which this young man killed women to end his own sexual temptations. And sadly, his own church's response was just to basically kick him out. We've had this um, mass murder in Boulder, and already I can hear the Muslim Christian rhetoric. You know, we have to ask ourselves, if we're in a parade where somebody says, I'm not going to wear a mask to protect my neighbor, or I really need to own a military-style gun to protect myself, maybe we're in the wrong parade. I was recently inspired to join a parade that Auburn Seminary is leading against white Christian nationalism. And they asked people that signed on to this to put it on their Facebook page, which I did with fear and trembling, because I know when you do that, you know, not everybody's going to be happy about it. And um, I really do. I, I have ongoing fear about it, but I, I believe it was the right thing for me to do. And I'm also inspired that the Session of Grace Church is considering a statement condemning hate against Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders and women. And, and this afternoon, there's going to be a prayer parade marching around the neighborhood. These are, these are amazing parades. We ought to be joining these parades because everybody loves a parade. But these two are going in different directions. And Jesus' parade that he begins on Palm Sunday challenges Christians to choose. And we're not going to change the world sitting silently at home. He's challenging us to choose which parade are you going to enter in. And if you're confused about which one's the right one to join, look all the way up at the front and see who's leading it. Is it a powerful ruler on a war horse? Or is it a simple man on a donkey? When Christians look up at the head of each of the parades, they'll know which one they should join. And may God have mercy on us as we struggle to discern such weighty matters. And so our Lord, head of the parade, the one who comes on a donkey, help us not to be fooled about the messages in this world. Help us to be as wise as serpents and as gentle as doves so that we get into the mighty parade that you're going to take all the way to the new kingdom that's coming. Amen. Long. Oh, I'll do it again. Let me start again. Sorry. That's right. No, just, yeah, go from there and walk to 
Oh, yes. Sorry. <laughs> it's a little too late. <laughs> All right, you got it. So now we're going to give to our mighty God, uh, our mighty God who comes to us as a gentle Savior. We're going to give our tithes and our offerings into his hands and into the causes of justice and liberation, compassion and love that he is um, in charge of. And so come now and bring your offerings to God. Boom. All right, well, that's that. You know, 